this time on The Gadget Show. Jason doesn't want to go to rehab. No, no, no. But in this week's challenge, I make him to see if I can win him off his Apple products. Ah! Is there better music software than iTunes? Is there a better phone than the iPhone? And is there a better laptop than my beloved MacBook? Do I really want to find out? So horrible! John travels to New York to test out speech recognition software with the fastest talking woman in the world. Once we tell the three little pigs, one little pig like to sing the thing. And Dallas has found an incredible mechanical spider to drive around in. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, regular viewers of our little programme will know that I'm a bit of a fan of the world of Apple. My phone is an iPhone, my laptop is a MacBook. In fact, I find it hard to walk past a fruit bowl and not take a bite out of an apple just to make it look right. <laughs> now, I can also see the attraction of beautifully designed Apple products. However, I do think that Jason's obsession has gone a little bit too far. So, my challenge this week is to take this poor fixated wretch <laughs> to an undisclosed high security location and open up his eyes beyond the world of Steve Jobs and his world of shininess. This behind-the-scenes filming shows just how addicted Jason is. He's always cradling his iPhone and even in an office full of computers he'd rather use his MacBook. We had no choice but to send him into rehab to try and kick his Apple habit. We didn't dare send Jason cold turkey straight away. Ow. So for the first part of the challenge we let him keep his iPod. <laughs> And beloved MacBook. Can just Back. try the other one? Yeah. Oh, 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 hang on a minute. Hang on. Cheers. Good luck, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Rehab rules stated that for the first stage of weaning me off Apple products, I had to try and buy music for my iPod, but without using Apple's iTunes. They've sold an incredible 163 million iPods throughout the world, which represents about 40% of Apple's income. The iTunes music management software is what enables you to download the tracks onto your iPod. But what's clever is that integrated within that software is a button that takes you directly to the iTunes store. So, not only have they sold an incredible 163 million iPods, but they've also plonked a little gateway to the very own shop on everybody's computer. iTunes has sold more than five billion songs, making it the biggest music retailer on earth. But will Jason be tempted by the alternatives that he is aware of, but never really considered to be contenders? The first piece of software that I want Jace to try is called Last FM. It's a UK website with about 21 million users. Think of it as a sort of radio station, but you control the playlist. So you literally just tune in and tell it exactly what you want it to play. Last FM um, so far has proved itself to be exquisitely straightforward. I mean, it's just really easy. Within seconds, you can be listening to your chosen song absolutely free. Prison's not that bad, you know, when you've got a bit of funk. I absolutely love this. You know, it's like having um, a massive music library, but not having to pay for it. However, if you do want to download a track permanently, then obviously you can buy it. Let's see if he can work it out. One thing I do love about iTunes is you just click it and it's an invisible process. Let's see if it's the same with Last FM. It is. Just click buy or download and you're given a choice of retailers. The cost is a competitive 79p and after a few clicks the song is on its way. Downloading now. I was really loving Last FM, and what's more, it has additional features. Its social networking aspects let you chat to other music fans. It's a very Web 2.0 approach to music, and its number of users has risen from 16 to 25 million in the last 18 months. Look out iTunes and your 70% market share. Right, now it's time to try Napster. It used to be the bad boy illegal site, but now it's cleaned up its act and it's fully legit. Looks really interesting, look. 79p a track, the Magic 79p. Sounds great. Right, I'm just going to click on the big download Napster button. Oh, oh, hang on. We're sorry, Napster is not currently compatible with your operating system. That's terrible! Napster uses Microsoft's digital rights management, but that's OK because more than 90% of the world's computers are PCs. Not OK if, like most of us, your MP3 player is an iPod. To get music from Napster onto your iPod, you need to burn it to a CD, re-import it into iTunes, and then transfer it to your iPod. Or you can strip the DRM protection from the Napster music with specialist software. But quite frankly, either solution is a complete faff. So, on to my third contender. 
Okay, time now for a retailing leviathan. One in every three pounds spent in the UK is spent in Tesco, making them one of the biggest retailers in the world. And now, guess what? They're muscling in on music. Lovely! Oh, I love this little central widget thing, which kind of flexes on an axis. I love the fact they've actually managed to do something that Apple haven't done in terms of design. But before long, you realise that Tesco Digital has a major limitation. It only offers 3.3 million songs, compared to iTunes, which has 8 million. The big question for me is, can I get those tracks onto my iPod? iPod-friendly music. I just, it just came up on my screen. We love iPods, and so do our music tracks. Unfortunately, it was a false dawn. Of the formats offered, iPods can only read MP3s, and currently that's not an option for all tracks. Come December, all tunes will be available in an MP3 format, which means that you'll be able to get them onto your iPods. However, here's the catch. Only if you've got a PC, because the website is not Mac compatible. Can I come out now? Ah, you see, there is life outside of iTunes. Susie, there is. I can't believe that at your first attempt you've weaned me off iTunes and maybe a Last FM fan. Have you been using it since? Yeah, almost exclusively. I think it's brilliant. So I've weaned him off iTunes. Join us later to see if I can wean him off the iPhone and, of course, the Mac book. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about speech recognition software. It's been around for quite a few years now. People, for example, who find it difficult to use a conventional keyboard can learn how to control their computer by voice command. It's been tried even on the likes of air traffic controllers and fighter pilots with varying degrees of success. Personally, I've always found it clunky and non-user friendly. Many a time I've been testing a gadget that claims to offer voice control only to find myself endlessly repeating commands and speaking slowly like a patronising primary school teacher in an effort to make the software understand me. The fact is, after all these years, they should have got it pretty good by now, so I set out to try some of the very latest offerings. I headed to New York City to test our programmes. 19 million people from all over the world live here, with lots of different accents. Perfect for putting speech recognition through its paces. For everybody in uh, the UK, welcome to New York. Our first test subject was Dragon Naturally Speaking 10. As well as dictation, you can use it to book meetings and search the internet with your voice. It's up against Windows speech recognition, which comes free with the Vista operating system. I hit the streets to find out which was best. Our first test is for usability. How good are these things fresh out of the box? I asked 12 people to read out a 92-word joke to see which system correctly identified the most words. The guy in a taxi wanted to speak to the driver, so he leaned forward and tapped him on the shoulder. The driver screamed, jumped up in the air and yanked the wheel over. The car mounted the curb. Demolished a lamppost and came to a stop. Inches from a shop window. The startled passenger said, I didn't mean to frighten you. I, I just wanted to ask you something. The taxi driver said, Not your fault, sir. It's my first day as a cab driver. I've been driving a hearse for the past 25 years. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Whoever wrote this should be dragged out into the street and beaten for a while. Normally, you'd have to spend half an hour training each of the programs to recognize your voice, but we were running them on generic profiles to really push them. I've been driving for the past 25 years. The programs analyze the sound waves of your speech and cross-check them against a database of words, selecting the words the sound waves match most closely. They were both right 66% of the time, although when they went wrong, they were just plain funny. Now we're on to test two, the complexity of the words they can handle. They've both got built-in dictionaries which you can add to, but I want to see how good they are from the off. So I headed to Central Park to test them with some more challenging words. Tropism. Insectivore. The Dragon's Dictionary has a data bank of a few hundred thousand words. Microsoft won't actually say how many words Vista has, but new words can be easily added. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. So, how did they fare? Well, it was Dragon that came out just ahead, recognising 36 out of 40 words, as opposed to Vista's 30. Betwixt. Ballyhoo! What if it does rude words? Hmm. 
My final test is for the speed and accuracy of the dictation. Most people talk at 120 words a minute, but type at 40, so speech recognition should make things quicker. But how much quicker? I headed over to Queen's to meet Fran Capo, stand-up comedian and the record-holding fastest-talking woman in the world. Hey, how are you? Very nice well, to meet you. you. Very good of you to okay, come. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Okay. Now, how fast exactly is it that you can talk? 603.32 words in 54.2 seconds, which comes out to 11 words a second. Which is well over 600 words a minute. Very good, yes, it is. <laughs> what does that sound like, exactly? <laughs> well, let's see, it goes like this. He that draws sick of my sin, the most harsh, the light into the shadow, the mighty sin, 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 the mighty Pieces of software so to cope with. So I think for each one, you should start speaking slowly. Okay. Then gradually build up your speed and see how fast you can get before they give up. Okay, before the machine starts smoking or something like that? That's right. What do you need me to do? Uh, Dragon. Let's start with this one first. All right, Dragon can apparently take a maximum of 160 words a minute. Vista reckons it can go up to 200. So it was time to see which could handle Fran's increasing speed the best. Both programs would face a rendition of Three Little Pigs. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. One little pig liked to sing. She started slow-ish at 120 words a minute, and both got the first line. Then the mistakes came. As Fran increased to 500 words a minute, the programs just couldn't distinguish between the sound waves quick enough and the words melted into each other. Vista did make a valiant attempt in the middle, picking up on the huff and puff and the chin chin chin, sort of. And before you think she's talking nonsense, she has been officially verified by Guinness World Records. But that didn't help with our results. You know what the good news is? We've got Once Upon a Time and War and Peace. <laughs> yeah, everything in between, it's gone. I'm Very sorry, but I, I just have to say, this is not very accurate. No, but it is dealing with an amazingly <laughs> ultimate test. She was great. Absolute hoot. OK, I just think generally both versions of the software, mm. they're not quite there yet. I want to be able to talk to my computer like I'm talking to you now and have it recognise it. But with these bits of software, you have to coax them, train them, nurture them into giving their best. OK, so yeah. G ratings. First up, uh, Vista's. Two program. Gs for Vista. Two Gs for Vista because it's surprisingly good, actually, and a lot of people won't have to pay any extra to get it, so you might as well just try it out and have a bit of fun. OK, but if yeah. you're more serious about it, is it worth investing in uh, Dragon's, naturally speaking, ten, I think it was, mm. that you used? Well, the Dragon is better, and I'm going to give it three Gs. It's not that much better, but undoubtedly it's the one of the two that if you're going to invest a lot of time in one of these programmes and really use it a lot, it's the one to go for. OK. <laughs> Now, here's something that you might be interested in. You can now watch The Gadget Show, or indeed any of five shows, via Freesat. That's the free-to-air digital satellite television service. The Gadget Show is on Channel 105, and all you'll need to watch it is a satellite dish and a set-top Freesat decoder. Unless, of course, you've got one of these. This is one of Panasonic's latest televisions, which has the Freesat decoder already built in. Now, it's one of the only televisions on the market to have the Freesat decoder already built in, and you just literally plug it in to your dish, and bingo, you've got 130 radio and TV channels. But the question is, is it any good? Well, John has been given this one a thorough testing. And if you want to know what he thinks of it, you can check out his review on Gadget Show Web TV, our weekly internet TV show on our website at 5.tv slash gadget show. Right, now it's time for the focus group. Each week on the focus group, John, Jason and I present the best new gadgets that we can find in a particular category to our focus group, and they tell us which one they like the best. Now, this week we're looking at camera gadgets, so we are surrounded by photography students from Wolverhampton University and... Birmingham City. Birmingham City <laughs> University, BCU. John, you can go first. Oh, now I've got a, a quick pod. It's the world's first fully extendable handheld tripod. The most original part is this, a sort of extending monopod. You can put any camera or camcorder up to a weight of 450 grams. And then the idea is that when you're travelling around, you switch the camera onto self-timer, or indeed have it in video mode, hold it up, and you get that extra height as well, and you can take a picture of yourself, wherever you are. 
I've got Canon Selfie ES3, which is a new little digital photo printer, and it works um, directly from your SD card or via infrared or Bluetooth, so basically you can Bluetooth pictures from your mobile phone and print them off straight away. It's really, really small, very compact, very portable, so let's choose a photo. Very easy to use, you've got this easy-use wheel here. There. Let's choose that one. And then this is great, this creative button here. And so you can change the style of your photos. You can have some graphics on there. You can make them black and white. Um, one of the effects we like is called pinhole, isn't it? Do you want to print that for us? Yeah, print. There we go. So the printing process goes through various different stages. You can see it working. It takes about a minute or so. And you can print onto postcards. You can make a calendar, regular cards. So it's just a really sort of small, cute, portable little photo printer that works really well. The quality of the print is excellent. So there you go. There is a lovely little photo, three of our little focus group, on a postcard. And Kieran, you can have that as a little souvenir. There you go. You, OK, in the age of YouTube and the citizen filmmaker, it's very hard to distinguish yourself. I've got a great way of doing it for under 50 quid. It's the world's first 3D webcam. Would you be my chief demonstrator? It's a technology called Anaglyph. What you're looking at there is some home video shot on a webcam just like this. So, Jack, what do you think to the quality of the image? Um, yeah, I mean, the bubbles sort of all come out at you and go all over the place and you actually get, like, really close to you as well. It does look really good, doesn't it? I mean, it's the sort of thing that if you're watching at home, you might not appreciate, unless, of course, you put on a pair of these glasses. But you can look on it in anything. You can look at it on a website, you can upload it to YouTube, you can upload it, you know, your blog. Uh, you could even put it on your phone. You can convert the video. It doesn't matter. Once it's shot on the webcam, it's in 3D. As well as showing off our kit to the focus group, we left them alone to have a bit of a play by themselves. Give our gadgets a bit of a test drive and make up their minds as to what they like best. I think it's a bit overpriced for £20. Well, the quality of the picture produced was all right, but the design of it really put me off. As a concept, it works quite well. Really good watching it come towards you. It's really interesting. OK, it's time for you to vote. You can only choose one of our three gadgets today. If you'd like to go with John's quick pod, raise your hands high. Ooh. Good result. Oh. One, two, three, four. four. OK. Yep. What about Susie's photo printer? Put your hand in the air right now. Very nice. <laughs> OK. And finally, the Monoro 3D webcam. Ooh. Wow, look at that. They're in 3D. There's loads of them. <laughs> Fantastic. So the Monoro 3D webcam wins. <laughs> Hurrah! Welcome back. Now it's time for a bit of Dallas. And this week he's got something very, very exciting and very, very weird to show you. Although, I must warn you, if you suffer from arachnophobia, you might want to roll up a piece of newspaper. Although it would have to be a very large piece of newspaper. You are about to encounter a giant eight-legged mechanical walking spider. It's the Mondo Spider. And I'm here to drive it. It's eight feet long, five feet high, and it weighs about as much as a small car. Now, it'll do up to 30 miles on a single tank of gas and was built by a team of highly brilliant and specialised artists and engineers. These guys. They made it from bits of old motorbike and reclaimed metal. Most of the spider was actually welded from scratch. It's just genius. But I had one important question. Why? Why did you build this? Uh, just basically because we could. We knew it would be pretty cool to have a car-sized walking mechanical spider, so we just yeah, decided to do it. It's actually a part engineering, part art project that cost over 20 grand to build, and I was itching to have a go. Brian ran me through a very intensive training program before my drive. OK. okay. Imagine you're holding the controls. Yeah. So we're going to go forward. Love that. Right. You can yeah. do that. And then back. Yeah. And now we want to turn. We're going to go, say we want to go to the left. Yeah. Like so. And back. So it's your basic caterpillar it's type vehicle similar. type thing. Yeah. I was ready to ride. OK. Hey! Hey! <laughs> it feels great. It's actually a lot smoother than my car. It's got a 24 horsepower engine. It'll do about four feet per second. And it's got a two foot stride. The cool thing is, it really looks like a spider when it moves, which is kind of freaky. Its unique movement is down to the leg linkage. Each leg is made separately and attached to one of the chain drives. They are powered by 2,500 PSI hydraulic motors, which push the legs down up to 2.6 times a second. 
Each leg is positioned in such a way that they hit the floor in a sequence that propels the Mondo Spider forwards. Each of the legs has a motorbike shock absorber built in, otherwise the force of walking would rip the machine apart. Luckily, that also made it quite comfy. This is brilliant! The noisy Honda engine is capable of 3,600 RPM, but I'd be driving on the low setting. After just five minutes, I thought I'd got the hang of it. Luckily, they agreed. Did I pass my driving test? Yeah, you uh, you did great. If you want, we could let you turn the speed up a little bit. Can, can, so we can go a bit faster on it? Can yeah. We? Oh, here we go! Oh, yes. With the speed cranked up, this thing was awesome. What I love about the Mondo Spider is that it has absolutely no practical use Whatsoever. The guys are now working on a giant eight-foot-tall mechanical gorilla. And if it's anything like the Mondo Spider, wow. I can't wait. That oh, was great. So much fun. I tell you what, arachnid forms of transport, the only way to travel. Right, talking of spiders, I've got something to show you. Can we have a look at this? Oh, it's nice. On. So this was designed oh. um, by a student at Staffordshire University. Oh, look at the movement. It's so elegant and balletic. It's really isn't nice. isn't it? Yeah. Now, what's really great about this is they put pressure sensors underneath those eight legs there. Right. And what that enables it to do is to detect the different terrain that it hits. I mean, I can imagine this in sort of space exploration. This would be a fantastic idea for, like, a lunar rover or a Mars rover or that type of thing. I think it's really cool. If you had a little sister, that would absolutely scare the living daylights out of her. It would be perfect for her bedroom. Now it's time to return to this week's challenge. Remember, I was given the task of showing Jason that there is actually life beyond his beloved Apple products. I began with an assault on iTunes, and I managed to prove that there is music software out there that's as good, if not better, than iTunes. Next up... That's my actual phone. My... You're I know! You're holding my actual phone. I know, I'm just saying, next up, my sights are set on your iPhone. No, it's not. It's, uh, you can't set your sights on my phone. Can I have my phone back, please? Yeah, but you've got rockets in if your I hand. If I was you, I wouldn't argue with a guy holding rockets. Yeah, OK. Really but if I was you, I wouldn't argue with someone's going to drop your phone. In you three, phone. two, one, catch. We've assembled three state-of-the-art mobiles that we reckon could be serious competition for the iPhone. The Nokia N96, the Sony Ericsson Xperia X1, and the hotly anticipated G1, the Google phone, with its brand new Android operating system. Our first mission was to choose just one of these phones that we thought could best take on the iPhone in three head-to-head -head challenges. So let's find out which is best. The N96's 5 megapixel camera is easily the best spec here, and it's also the only phone of the trio with video capture. But with no touchscreen or QWERTY keyboard, it just lacks a little bit of cutting-edge kudos. The Sony X1 is a far slicker proposition. The trouble is we found it completely counterintuitive to use. Right, so let's say this is emergency and you've got to dial 999, otherwise we're going to burn down in here. Go. <laughs> God, you can't have you that can't, fingers. You got, you got... There it is. Nice, well done. All the other phones, we've, we've been able to do exactly what we wanted to do without reading the manual, haven't we? The G1 is a much simpler phone to use. Really quick, take a picture, it gives you the options. If you just want to save it, you save it and you move on. Yeah, that's Isn't good. that nice? That's good. The Linux-based Android system is very impressive. Designed like open source software that's easy to upgrade, it's also very fast. Got an idea, and we point at the one that we want to use that we think might take on the iPhone. Ready? Okay, yeah. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> <laughs> And so we entered the arena of doom for the three head-to-head -head challenges. Suzy's G1 against my iPhone. And just to add a little spice, the loser each task would receive an electric shock. Test one, to see which phone is best for sending multimedia messages. First to take a picture and send it to the gadget phone wins. Three, two, one, go. Oh, you can't do it, you I can't do it on that phone. It's a terrible thing, but you can't send an MMS from an iPhone. It's ridiculous, but I'm thinking I might be able to find a third-party app that will do it for me. The application store has a button on the iPhone's desktop that will connect you via Wi-Fi or 3G to a whole host of additional software and games you can download to pimp up your iPhone. Some are free, but this MMS app cost me £1.19. So it is now sent. Insert, take a picture. What? No! Yes! No! It's there. Take a picture! It's there. Take a picture, quick! It's there. Take a picture, quick! Use too photo! Late. You're too late. What? You're too late. I... 
You know what that means, don't you? What's that? Stand by for a shock. OK, shock him in three, two... Ah! You did it on two! Ow! Test two, to see which phone can retrieve information from the internet the quickest. The question, what was Apple's total revenue in 2007? Go. <laughs> I'm using the Google window, which very conveniently is located right at the top of the miniature version of Safari on the Apple iPhone. My G1 uses a Google operating system and bills itself as the phone that's built for the internet, so I had high hopes. The QWERTY keyboard would make surfing an enjoyable experience, and the fact that it will connect using 3G Edge or Wi-Fi means it will almost always find a network. My iPhone has the same connectivity capabilities. My touchscreen keypad is definitely less accurate to use, but I really felt I had the advantage when it came to surfing with my luxurious 3.5-inch screen. Apple total revenue for 2007, no! 24 billion US dollars. Correct. Oh! Yes! You were close, Susie, but you know what that means. Ready? I can't stand it. <laughs> It was one all, and next was the deciding test. Which phone's mapping software was the easiest to use? First to find out the distance between Torquay and Skegness would be the winner. Go! Both the phone's GPS applications use Google Maps. The G1 has it pre-loaded, and the iPhone's desktop icon links to a bundle of Google Maps. Since they both run the same mapping system, this will be a test of the phone's interfaces and how quickly we could input the information and each handset process it. Waiting. I'm getting directions. I'm getting directions. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Uh, 311.2 miles. Correct. Yeah! No! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Come on! Oh. <laughs> More kisses? No, I'm not that excited. It's just the text entry on this cannot compete with that. And, of course, that processor. It just brings up that data, doesn't it? You were impressed with that, weren't you? I'm really impressed. Are you ready? Yeah. There's the iPhone oh, that, that you lost with. Yeah. OK, shock him in three, two, one. Ah! <laughs> oh! 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 oh. <laughs> that was funny. It was painful. <laughs> no, it was funny. <laughs> anyway, the star of that, I thought, was the Google Android software, don't you? Oh, Susie, I think you're so right. I mean, this handset from HTC, the G1, is clunky. I mean, that hinge yeah. really is nasty. Uh, but when they get it right, when all the, the myriad phones come out in the next 12 months with Android on them, there's going to be a combination somewhere along the line that really works. But it's a fantastic starting point for Android, isn't it? And I think it's really something to get excited about. Right, now it's time for another top five. No man is truly happy unless he's got a nice big toolbox. And no toolbox is happy unless it's crammed full of power tools. So to help you choose the right and best ones, here's a rundown of this week's top five power tools. I have put together five of the best pieces of DIY kit that you can get your hands on. And to help me put them in the right order, I've enlisted the help of professional builder, DIY aficionado and telepresenter, Dave Wellman. Thank you very much for helping me. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. Do you want to see what we've got? Yes, let's have a look. What have we got? After Dave and I had got stuck in with plenty of drilling, sanding and sawing, we were able to decide which of our power tools impressed us the most. At number five is the Bosch Prio cordless multi-sander. It's powered by lithium-ion batteries, so you can sand away wherever you like. Dave, have a go. Tell me what you think. Let's try it out. Good grip. Yeah. Like that. And just nice. It's taken the paint off well enough. Light and convenient, the Prio lets you sand in all those awkward areas, but it also has another nifty trick up its sleeve. Look, we've worn out one of the delta corners already, and what you want to do is that two-piece comes off, Turn it round, then you've got the next bit to use. At number four is the Black & Decker 18-volt compact chainsaw. Right, I should be completely safe with this Black & Decker. It's got a double handle and this anti-kickback chain for safety. Watch out, Dave. Being cordless and weighing just 2.8 kilograms, this little beauty is effortlessly portable and makes light work of slicing through even thick tree trunks. What do you think? For an 18-volt saw, that is pretty good. That's pretty impressive. At number three is the Bosch Unio multi-tool. 
Right, Dave. Cordless, three-in-one, multi-power tool mm -hmm. for a bit of screwing, drilling and hammer action. Fantastic. Take it away. Let's have a look. Whether you need to drill holes in a tough bit of slate or put screws in a bit of 2 by one timber, the Uneo is as powerful as it is convenient. Plug it in to recharge it so there's no loads of changeable batteries. Nice quick change chunk. Mm. So, so you reckon that's a keeper then? That's definitely a keeper. Something to hang up in your garage. At number two is the GMC Flash Cell Cordless Screwdriver. It will completely charge from flat in 45 seconds. 45 seconds. Because it uses capacitor batteries instead of regular batteries, so it's not relying on a chemical reaction. Fantastic. So in 45 seconds, I can use that. Yeah. Brilliant. And there it is. It's there you go. fully charged. Look, and ready to go. Ready? Yeah. See? Brilliant. Make your bird table. And the flash shell certainly does make short work of screwing in dozens of screws. If it runs out. <laughs> You ain't got to wait 45 seconds for it to charge. That's good. Look at that. GMC's 45 second quick charge. Come on. But at number one, it's the truly brilliant Power 8 Workshop. It's a toolbox come workstation with its own power tools. Inside, it's got saws and drills complete with their own rechargeable battery power supply. It's like a transformer. If we take the drill body out, this gives you a workstation. Yeah, this little bit here mm. into that hole. And that fixes onto there. Oh, it's beautifully crafted. Look at that. How good is that? This fits very neatly. Drop that down. Fits like that. Beautiful. That's great, isn't it? It's just all there. I mean, if you want to know more about it, you've got to buy one and read the instructions. Oh, we love it. Power 8 Workshop. Welcome back. Right, let's get straight down to business. The business of this week's challenge, in which I face the job of convincing him <laughs> that apples are not the only tech fruit. And to be honest, the last part of the challenge was always going to be the most tricky, as I had to convince him to put aside... No. Give it to me no. now. To put aside Never. his... Will he give me... Just give it to me. Give me Never. Your, put aside your MacBook. No. Give it to Move me. Away from What's the that stupid voice you're doing? Just it's like it. a it's a voice from the grave saying Just there is some evil spirit that will befall you if you grab my book of Mac. Give it to me. Give it, Give it to me. Never. I will never succumb. Cause in session. State your case. Just why is this MacBook so good? Oh, uh, <clears throat> okay, my honour, your lord, uh, my love. Thank you. It's milled out of a solid piece of aluminium. So it's a lump of metal. Yeah, it's, it's a lump of metal, but it's aluminium metal. So it's very light and it's very strong. And because it's got no joins around these sorts of areas where it gets a lot of use, you know, it's not going to crack or, or break. It's also got... Can you see there's a glowing light there? Yeah? OK, that's the metal glowing. They've milled it thin at that point so that the light comes through the metal. Yeah, well, that's all very well. But what about attention to cost? I offer you Exhibit A, the cheapest MacBook on the market, £719. You can't argue with the fact that you can get a better spec PC for about half the price of that. Sometimes, my darling, you can't put too much emphasis on pleasure. I get a lot of pleasure from typing. This is all about your typing, is it? You better believe it. I mean, there is not a laptop on the market, in my opinion, that is as lovely to type on as this. I would say I can type quicker and more efficiently on this keyboard than on any other laptop I've ever used. I feel a challenge coming on. If I can find you a laptop that can suit all your needs, that's lighter and cheaper that you can type on, will you give up that Apple? I think that's so unlikely, my lad, that I accept that bet. OK. Take him down. What have you pressed? Hello? My darling, what have you done? I've chosen the stylish, solid-state Asus 101, which I think can take on the MacBook in more than just looks. It's a PC using the familiar Windows operating system and has the same one gig of DDR RAM as the Mac, yet at just one kilogram, it's half the weight. It only has a single processor compared to Mac's dual core, but it's £250 cheaper. Now, the spec is important when choosing a laptop, but as nearly all laptops come in a whole range of specs, that doesn't necessarily govern what you buy. Indeed, the main difference between the Mac and PC is the operating system. I'm perfectly happy using either, so that's not a big issue for me. The most important part of my laptop is the keyboard. And as I spend hours every day typing, my choice of laptop really does come down to the typing experience. I love the accuracy and feel of my MacBook's keyboard, and if I'm even to consider changing to the Asus, it's going to have to fully satisfy me in that department.
So, for our challenge, Jason will have to copy out a paragraph using both laptops while his typing speed and accuracy are measured. He'll be typing in the most extreme circumstances possible, inside a NASA-designed gyroscope subjecting him to 2G. First up, the MacBook. OK, release the brake, chaps. Jason Bradbury. Yes. In three, yes. two, one, start the clock. Go! OK. God made the angels. This is easy. Oh, I'm well, making a chaps. few mistakes. Oh, let him go. Let oh, him go. no! <laughs> oh, my Lord! Are you still typing? In no way am I typing! It has keys set in metal enclosures, making them both thinner and more durable. The design has also evolved, so now each key is evenly separated by a three millimetre gap, making mistyping much less likely, even in extreme circumstances. Stop the clock! I've done it! Oh. Are you right? Yeah, I'm fine. They made me do it, the voices in my head. I know, and you were right to do it because it tested that machine to the max. Do you want to just take a moment? Yeah. Because I want to look at your results. OK, James, here's your results for the MacBook. Your speed was 25 words a minute and you made eight mistakes. That's actually pretty good considering you were nearly vomiting. Right, now it's time for the Asus. Start the clock. How does it feel on your fingers, that keyboard? Terrible. Why terrible? Explain. Because it's too small. The keys are too small, they're too light. There was a whale. I can't get to the right shift key at all. It's a complete chaotic movement. Do you know what? Yeah. I think you're being a bit negative about this because it's not your Mac. And I think you're going to have to go upside no, down. I don't think so. Take them, boys. The... Even though the Asus keys are half a millimetre wider than the Mac, the space between each one is just one millimetre. So horrible! Which is one third of that of the Mac. On top of this, the Mac spacebar is 15 millimetres longer and its mouse mat is 50% wider than the Asus. Cut me out, I'm going to be sick. OK. Immediately. <laughs> oh, God. Poor thing. It's rubbish. Are you you right? need to check what I've typed. It's rubbish. It's okay. not a Mac preference. It's an honest reaction to it. It is no contender. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so sorry that you had to it witness awful. that. I saw it at close hand. It's as well. nasty, wasn't it? It was nasty. But, I mean, the, the, the important result here is that the MacBook was a clear winner. Well, I mean, absolutely. You just didn't like typing on the other one. I at didn't. All. And this is—it's relatively lightweight, especially with the new aluminium housing for the MacBook. Mm. And those keys are brilliant. But it, of course, it's not all about the typing, is it? No, of course it's not. That's You're not... a Mac fan. What do you like about the Mac? Put quite simply, I like the fact that when you switch it on, it switches on instantly and turns off straight away. Yeah. I like some of the applications. I like uh, playing with iPhoto. I find that very sort of. Interesting. And it's a pleasure experience, isn't it? I yeah. mean, there are some great-looking laptops out there, but it's just got to be said, when you use a machine like this, it's a real pleasure. And, of course, you can't say enough about the, about the, uh, the operating system. It's so secure. You never get any viruses and stuff like that. OK, so, so I you did failed. fail you at failed. the final hurdle to wean him off, but I did quite well with, with Last of I got you off iTunes. That's the surprise of this week's challenge, I have yep, to say. it is. That. And that's about all we've got time for um, on this week's show. Hands we've got a great show MacBook. for you next week. Yeah. I'm just trying to say goodnight. Just because I'm friendly doesn't mean you can grab the book. Just share it. Hand it back. Share it. Share does not Compute. Just don't be silly, I want to just have a go. Does not compute. Good night. Get back, Good Macbook, back. <laughs>